the most technologically advanced drumheads on Earth. What does that mean exactly? It means power, control, and all the tools you need to reshape the future of percussion. Choose wisely. Hey, welcome back to the Drum Rundown. We are back again at Marathon Music Works in Nashville, Tennessee. And today I am sitting with one of the drummers of one of my favorite bands of all time. And I told him before I was gonna fangirl, so he was cool with it. <laughs> it is Matt Greiner of August Burns Red. What's up, dude? Thanks for having me. You too, man. Thanks for having us. And yeah. uh, we just got done chatting backstage about all kinds of things and life and the road and all that stuff just to get it out of the way. Thrill Seeker, that album kind of changed everything for me, the way you played, and that sound hadn't really happened before, mm -hmm. at least to my ears. So I just want to say thanks for all of that. And it's awesome to get to sit behind this kit and talk about what got you there. Talk to me about what you got on the road. Yeah, thank you for having me on the show. Of course, This man. is really cool, really an honor to be here. Um, so a little bit about my setup first. I, it took me a while to figure out how to set up my cymbals and my drums. And once I figured it out, I really haven't changed it okay. much since. But let me tell you about how I got here. Yeah, because dude, that's the, that's whole the sauce. story. Yeah. So if you're watching this and you're a drummer and you you've had experiences like this, it'll um, you'll you'll probably be able to relate to it on a couple levels. I felt like quitting drums entirely when I was trying to get this setup. So if you've ever been sitting in your practice space and you're like, I can't figure out how to set the kit up so it's ergonomical. Um, and you're just moving stands around and you can't get stuff where you want it to be and you feel like you have it and then you start playing and it's like this feels terrible. That was me in 2006 in the barn at Grinder Farms where we started the band. And I remember working for like four or five hours on this. I was so frustrated. I couldn't get my crashes where I wanted them. The effect symbols were all kind of jumbled. <laughs> and I was like, what do I do? do I, I'm so sick and tired of this I feel like just giving up altogether like I don't want to play drums anymore because I can't get my setup the way I want it to be so I remember walking out of the barn I walked into my parents house and my dad was sitting in the living room I said dad I, I'm done I'm so pissed off right now <laughs> I quit drumming and of course he is a role model to me and really didn't have a whole lot of words but what he said was impactful he said do not quit he said quitters never win and winners never quit. And I took some time for myself. I went back out and I went back to the kit. And about 30 minutes later, I came up with this. So you're looking at like 14 plus, you're looking at 17 years later, I have this shelf system. Yeah. Crashes are up top. Effect symbols are in the middle. My hat and ride are fairly low with my bells. And this is the setup that when I figured it out, I finally figured it out. I was like, thank you, God. I, I can play this in a way that just makes sense for uh, my height and the length of my arms and the speed of my band. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm probably never going to change this. And in fact, all these years later, 
it's still what I'm playing. It's the ride or die. Yeah. The ride and crash or die. Or die. Yeah. <laughs> so that's so interesting, right? Because you have such a technical thing going on in your band. There's a lot of dynamics. There's obviously the breakdowns and the drops, and then a lot of just the technical proggy chops. Yeah. So do you feel like when you got to that comfort, because you had already recorded some awesome stuff before that, so you get to that point, you Thank get you. a roadblock. Mm -hmm. When you kind of get to this configuration, do you feel like your composition palette just like got blown wide open because now you're getting to get to things ergonomically that you couldn't reach before, so it elevates your parts? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So when I write drum parts, I use this method called creation, memorization, application. And in the creation phase, you try to get rid of all the fluff and just bring it down to the keep it simple stupid. Kick, snare, maybe hats. Then you memorize it create it, memorize it, and then you apply it. And it's that last phase when you're applying a sticking or a rudiment, and now you have access to all of these instruments that felt like they were three miles away. Like, we can all relate to when you start playing drums, you're over here, yep. kick, snare, and hat, yeah. and you're like, at least for me, I was like, how do I get over there? Mm -hmm. and, then one, and then one day you're like, all right, I'm over here, how do I get back to my hat? Yeah. It's kind of funny to think about now because, of course, you can fail or you can just move over, but it just felt like this huge move that was insurmountable. Yeah, especially at 300 BPM, <laughs> right? <laughs> AVR will never, <laughs> no, I quit if that's the case. So it just makes everything easier. Um, I remember years ago someone said to me that your drum set shouldn't be something you fight, it should just be something you play. Yeah. And honestly, that's a challenge um, all these years later at times, but I try to keep that in my mind that just play along with the kit. Don't feel like you have to fight it. And the setup will give you an advantage. And I found this to be the most ergonomical where I have this shelf yeah. system. And I'm so glad you keep saying that word because it makes me sound less like a crazy person because I always point at the camera and I say, ergonomics is the thing the feel like you got you can't be fighting body tension and stuff because it's just going to blow the moment yeah you're going to get frustrated and leave mm -hmm. the barn and tell your dad you quit yeah <laughs> so I'm, and i'm really glad you didn't quit because you guys just put out a new thing that is even heavier and crazier than stuff that you put out before and thank i you. love it thank you so let's talk about this configuration and why it feels so good mm -hmm. what let's start with the kit first run us around the toms and the sizes and, and the setup yeah before I get to that, I will say, um, don't, don't watch this or listen to this and think that I have it figured out just because I have the configuration. The first 10 days of this tour, if my drum tech was here, he's, he's somewhere. I had him move something almost every day okay. because yeah. I just didn't feel in sync. And what happened was my, my seat was too close. My snare was too far left. Those two factors were just huge. And this is a game of inches. It, dude, it, I, have, I carry a yardstick with electrical tape that mm -hmm. is like to the quarter inch. And like, mm -hmm. if I'm not in there, I'm gonna have a bad, <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna have a bad gig. It's, so, it's how, so weird to think about, but it's really a game yeah, of dude, inches. it's crazy. And I mean, we talk to different drummers and it's like, the rug is like taped out or like this is that, mm -hmm. or like they just know or they feel it. Um, how do you approach getting to that energy where you know it's right how yeah. do you how do you approach it what's your process uh you have to be honest with yourself okay like if yeah. if you're not playing well it could be you but it also could be something's just not where it needs to be and if you care about what you do which is what i told my tech i'm sorry spencer i keep coming to you and changing things the day i stop doing this is the day i should go home mm -hmm. because you just don't care anymore i i, I still care i want to play well and um, so if you have a high standard for yourself, you'll just autocorrect. And in my case, don't overthink <laughs> your setup, um, but also care about what you're playing yeah. and how you're playing and what you're, and how it's set up. And they'll sort of work together in unison. Okay, so it's like balancing being like an OCD, like everything, game of millimeters, and then kind of not beating yourself up for it. Yep, okay. do what you need to do and then turn it off and play drums. Yeah. Yeah, because that's what I think we're trying to get to about how people set their stuff up is like, mm -hmm. how do you get this so it's your toolkit so yeah. that you can crush in an arena every night and right. go and, and entertain. Arena, things. not so much for well, us, hey. but, uh, you know, a club. Yeah. <laughs> but thank you. Uh, so as far as my, my setup, um, I play all DW drums. Yep. It's collector series, pure maple with reinforcement rings. 
I like maple the best. I've, I've tried other wood configurations and this is just the most straightforward. Uh, you get the tone you want, but it's, it's not too warm. It's not, um, not too complex. It just is what it is and it's great. Yeah. So I recommend pure maple. Re-rings just give you a little bit more of the punch. I remember the, the first time I put Evan's EC2 clears on when mm -hmm. they first came out, I remember putting them on a kit and just hearing that perfect snap, if you will, to the to at least the Tom, uh, the 10 inch Tom. That's the sound I get out of re-rings, I find. It's like you get this snap to it that really yeah. makes you want to play drums. <laughs> yeah. For my snare drum, uh, my backup is a bronze. And my primary is a brass. Which we lifted out before we started rolling because mm -hmm. this was getting some maintenance. That you got a thing, little, got dude, a little workout. Wait, he said it was like 27 pounds yeah. or something? <laughs> it, it's, uh, it's no joke, it's heavy. Yeah, this thing, this it thing just cool. has... Yeah. I don't know how you put that sound uh, into words, but it's... That's it. Brass snare me. drum. I mean, I've, the more I sit with brass snare drums, it's like there's a vibe. Yeah. You can feel it. There's a crack and there's, it also feels really good to play. Yeah. If you're a drummer, you know that when you hit a drum that doesn't feel good to play, who cares how it sounds? And this drum, it just. Yeah, I think it's like rock there, solid. There's like a call and response thing that's happening, I think, between you and the drum where it's like you making it, it sings or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know. There's like a vibe that's that it gives. It. It. It's like it's, it, you, it sings. Yes. Yeah. It does what you want it to do. It does. Yeah. And what I'm finding interesting about your toms that I haven't seen since sitting down with drummers is these are in the note of E and C and whatever this one is. Uh -huh. So that's something interesting we haven't got to talk about with anybody. Uh -huh. What's it like knowing that's a tumber note C. Yeah, so that is something DW does on their drums, and it's, as far as I know, it is just the sound of the shell. Yeah, the natural it, right? Yeah, yeah. It's inconsequential to what I do. So you're not chasing that? That's not no. informing tuning? You're not doing anything with no, that? No, I'm, I'm not even really concerned about what it says about the timber note. What, what I'm looking at is TuneBot, which is a little device we have. Yep. Uh, there's a studio version and a gig version. That is our gospel for how we tune drums. Okay. So you mount it on the side of the drum and you're listening for the frequency in hertz of the tension rods. It's not based on the tension mm -hmm. of this because I sweat a lot and they get rusty. Yep. It's based on the actual note. So we tune the head to the note that we have saved. And in the studio, I actually do an octave here and then this is a fifth. Okay. So if you're playing a song like Whitewash, you have these two drums singing in unison. And then this is in the middle. So if you're playing bomb, bomb, these will sing together and it's almost like tuning a guitar. It's yeah. very methodical. Right, and things uh, being relative and having the fifth in there lets this be melodic, like lets your drum fill have like a melody of its own. Exactly. Or match what the guys are doing. Yeah, and, and, and when you play drums, I like to think of it as creating melodic parts. Like yeah. uh, I don't look at drumming as just a rhythmic thing, which is why I love effect symbols. Yeah, right. I have all these guys, and it just gives me, it's like the, someone's porch. Yeah, that was a, like, it was a doorbell. <laughs> there you go. That's the bread and butter of my kit. Yeah. My favorite thing about my drum set are my cymbals, and my second favorite thing about my drum set is my drum set. Yeah. I've always been that way. I've just loved effect symbols and taking something right here on your hi-hat, really simple, and moving it across, maybe. Because all of a sudden you're hiding something really simple inside of something that sounds kind of right. complex, just because yeah. you're taking eighth notes and moving them. That's really the essence of what I'm trying to do. Take something simple and make it sound hard to play. But yeah. if you boil it down, it's really that whole idea of creation, memorization, application. Yeah, it's like meat and potatoes, seasoning salt. There you go. And pepper and paprika and whatever that one is. Yes. Yeah. Sriracha. Sir, sriracha, dude, sriracha. <laughs> Always sriracha. So we got Zildjian's up. Let's run yeah. around uh, okay. this spice rack. Yeah. We'll start over there. Uh, Zildjian ate custom hi-hats. Yes. And then what else? Let's go across. All right, these are the master sounds. First time I heard these was Carter Beaufort. I just yep. loved how crisp his hi-hat sounds. Um, 
what I didn't realize is that most of that is just Carter Beaufort yeah, and not dude. so much the hi-hats. So, so he could be playing dude. a sack of potatoes and make it sound awesome. These are really great hi-hats, 14 inch A custom master sounds. Um, I use A custom crashes. Funny story about that. I went in to record Thrill Seeker actually in 2005 yeah. in Franklin, Tennessee with Adam D. It was such a fun experience and I knew nothing about how to record. I hardly knew how to play drums at the time. I just could write cool drum parts. So we yeah. went in, I had a Z custom crash that was just coated in green sweat and just, it was bad. And Adam D looks at it and he goes, yep, we're making a trip to Guitar Center. Yeah. <laughs> and we went in and we bought at least one A custom cymbal and he's like, this is the cymbal you need to okay. record. So A custom crashes, 19 inch, 18 inch, I use a K Custom 20 inch ride. It has a lot of ping. Mm -hmm. Like really good stick definition, yep. which is what I want. I don't crash my ride. It's just there yeah. to uh, do fast thrash stuff on and blast beats. Cool. Uh, I use, so my effect symbols are nine inch Oriental Trash Splash, 12 inch Oriental Trash China, and 18 inch Oriental China. Yeah. And then my favorite, of the cymbals are my blast bells. So this is a nine inch bell that I drove to Zildjian in 2010 to make. I didn't love the sound of the Zill bell and I wanted something darker and something with shorter sustain. I came back with like 10 of these and like 20 of the seven inch yeah. blast bells. These are now on the market being sold internationally uh, thanks to everyone that's asked me about them over the years and started buying them. And these just work really well together. There's like a harmonic dissonance to both. Mm -hmm. They have this darker tone to them and they don't yeah. ring for three years. They're beefy. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, they're beefy. And I love that it's got the short sustain. It's not into the next phrase because like you're getting into stuff so quick, you want that splash to be almost like a pyro. It's and then it's gone because you're moving. You know, like you said, how do you get from here to back over there? Yeah. It's almost like you need that to be out. So if this thing is like yes. sustaining, it's it's crushing the next Exactly. Part. There's only so much space for, yeah, these, dude, it's for tight, these instruments. Because you got to think, I'm just one of five musicians on yeah. the stage. So, you know, guitars are going crazy. Jake's going crazy. And I'm just one piece that has to fit in this little grid. It's a frequency cage fight. <laughs> wow. That is that is our a... new band name? <laughs> Frequency <laughs> cage fight. I mean, but it, it's, really it's true. It. You got to sit in a band with a lot of dynamics, right? Mm -hmm. And you're doing a lot of, you know, um, a lot of the parts have a lot of dynamics because you'll be doing proggy chop stuff, mm -hmm. tried into a breakdown, and on the new stuff, the breakdowns are super heavy and yeah. like dark. So yeah, yeah, you need this color palette because it's working. Yep, it's working great. That's a good way to put it. What else? Well, what are you beating on them with? We've got sticks. Okay, yeah. yeah, that's, that's important to the tone of it as well. So I have Vic Firth drumsticks. I have a signature stick through Vic Firth that we are currently redesigning. Um, we are on version three of it. It's okay. not done, but it's based largely on the rock stick. The reason I like the rock stick is because it's longer and just has more meat to it. And the reason I like a heavier stick is you get a lot of the bounce back mm -hmm. because it's a it's a heavier stick. Yeah. So people like to think that, oh, it's harder to play because it's thicker and heavier. Well, you're actually getting a lot of help because much like when you're playing, you know, spring tension's high on your kick, your beater's coming back yeah. that much faster. Right. Power's coming from the stick as well as the wrist. Right. The arm. Yeah, mm -hmm. you're getting a little bit. That's awesome. Yeah, Very especially cool. for like uh, French grip, which if you can see this, yeah. it's, it's a lot of the finger, your, your thumb is up. So I use that on ride or hat or even on snare. Not so much on your toms, it's more of an American grip there, but just feels feels right. That's cool. So Vic Firth rock sticks. I use Ultimate Ears, which I have on somewhere here. I feel yeah. like a robot, I have all these electronics. Uh, these are the, I believe these are the Lives. These are the UE Lives, yes. And this is a really good in-ear, this is how I Hear what I'm playing, click track, guitar, yeah. bass. I don't need vocals and drums. So I mix you, everything like pretty center, okay. like an album. I All don't right. want to hear drums too loud. Kick pedals are also important. Yes. They are beating on stuff as well. Yes, they are. Uh, DW9000 is kind of like top of the line. Yeah, these are great pedals. I actually switched to the XFs, which is the extended okay. footboard. Gives you, I don't know how Longboard. much extra, but it's it just allows your feet to stay back further on the pedal. 
and instead of stabbing with your heel up, you can hypothetically yeah. play a little lower to the ground yep. because you can pull back yeah. a little more. So I have spring tension as tight as it gets. Okay. I use the DW stock beaters, which are pretty heavy. Mm -hmm. And um, these pedals are great. I replaced the center link with the black uh, aftermarket, which okay. is a little beefier. The stock center link has these, has these, um, uh, these rivets that I find after enough shows. I mean, we're playing for 80 minutes a night, 85 yeah. minutes a night. They tend to wear out a little bit. And when you hold your beater, and you move your left cam, there's some space between them. And I, I don't know how big of a difference it makes, but there's a little bit of lag, at least on the way back. And my advice for just generally all of this is, your gear is really only a, a small percentage of yeah. your performance. You need to practice. And I wish I could go back and tell myself that <laughs> when I was 17, because I felt like every two days I was like, oh, okay, I need to change my spring tension. It's, it's too tight or it's too loose, or I need to change the cam on the Pearl Eliminator. I need to go to the red one instead of the blue one, or uh, you just, you feel like everything else is the problem. Yeah. And it, my advice to myself would be, whatever you have, use it and practice a lot, because then you'll be so much more versatile. If you're playing in a band that flies a lot and you don't have the gear you need, you'll be able to play it. Yeah. And I wasn't like that. I was, I had my kit and I needed to play my kit or else I couldn't play drums. And that was something I, I really had to work through and I still do to some extent, like it's, I feel like I need my setup to be able to play my songs. And the more you can get away from that and take some of the blame, if you will, be like, I need to be better. I need to practice more. It's not my gear, it's me. You're doing a good job of getting yourself ahead by not needing specific gear. Yeah, because I mean, there are working drummers that are workforce guys that are still doing, you know, a couple hundred nights a year and they're doing it on house kits or backline. And you yep. gotta be able to sit behind a house kit and get it done yep and you can't necessarily be precious mm -hmm. and you're just hoping that stuff's not falling on you I, right. had, I had a really bad moment i still have you know some trauma over it my last show just had symbol stuff crashing really? on me so Ugh. but but you have it's to be able feeling. yeah dude it's terrible but you have to be able to get it done in not a perfect scenario yeah and i think that's important to remember yes it is i actually go for a run before i play and I call it my boxing run. I get out and I, I pray that, you know, God shows up in the room and that it's more than just about us on stage. Um, but, but also I say, you know, if things go wrong, I'll just be able to laugh at them, yeah. you know? And, and that, that way at least you're prepared for things to go wrong and you're not like, oh my gosh, what do I do? For example, last night, snare drum, this snare drum blew out the rezzo head. I played like two songs with the head gone. Ugh. And what are you gonna do? So yeah. you just, you smile about it after the show, the band's like, wait, what? You didn't, your snare was a tom? Oh yeah, it was literally this. For like eight, 10 minutes. It's still and better than St. Anger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually I agree with that. Uh-oh, <laughs> see you all in the comments. <laughs> Uh, you just have to be able to laugh at stuff because it's not yeah. going to go your way. And it, it really doesn't matter that yeah. much to the crowd, of, even to your band who's listening to everything in in-ears. It's crazy. Well, you're certainly getting it done. This is an awesome rig. Uh, very impressive. Thanks for sitting down with us. Excited Absolutely. to see you play. Yes. Um, excited about the new music. Do you have anything that you want to talk about around uh, the new stuff coming out? Uh, our new album comes out at the end of March. It's called Death Below. Awesome. Uh, I'll be home for a lot of the year teaching drum lessons. If, if you're interested in talking setup or gear or anything, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, that'd be awesome, but I appreciate yes. you having me on. We will link all of that stuff in the comments below. Make sure that you guys get in uh, in the comments below and tune up Perry about the St. Anger comment. <laughs> tune me up about some of the dumb stuff I said. And me too. And what Matt said. I say dumb stuff. Stay tuned. You'll see another episode in about two weeks because this is the Drum Rundown. I've been here with Matt Griner of August Burns Red. We will see you guys on the next one. Killer.